Hi friends, welcome to my channel where I discuss tech and travel. Today I wanted to talk about concepts and strategies you should learn to become an effective software engineer. This is mostly directed at people who are self-taught developers or feel that there are gaps in the knowledge they learned through college or boot camp relative to what skills are needed in the industry. I'm hoping to create more transparency over the fundamentals of software engineering so you know exactly what skills employers expect their engineers to know. And there's a lot of ground to cover. You really don't want to miss out. I'll also list out all of the resources for the topics listed in the description below. So be sure to check that out at the end of this video. So without further ado, let's begin. First up is object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is a computer programming model that organizes software design around objects rather than functions. It's helpful in the sense that you're easily able to reuse and recycle code in the form of instantiating objects without redoing much of the existing logic. Some of OOP's main features include abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. I can dive into the details of this at a later time, but these are the essentials for understanding many backend languages. Next up is data structures and algorithms. Now, to be honest, you may only use the most basic of data structures and algorithms once you, en once you enter into the industry, but there are two vital things to note here. One, having an in-depth understanding of concepts such as stacks, queues, binary search, 2D arrays, graphs, and trees helps you learn how to learn. It helps you understand the nuances of ways to store and access data, as well as the difference between space and time complexity. These are important to understand because knowing when to use a fixed array versus knowing when to use a tree map could mean the difference between a customer waiting for data to load on their page right away versus waiting for five seconds. Now, five seconds isn't a big deal, right? Well, actually it is. Google did a study showing that 53% of mobile website visitors leave pages if they don't load within three seconds. Not only that, but one of the most common ways to store data today is a database. This uses a concept called indexing. It relies heavily on the use of nested hash maps in order to speed up the time for searches. Kick. And what about Git? You've used Git to check in code changes before. Well, that relies on those dreaded tree structures that constantly have to be rebalanced every time we decide to do a rebase or merge. The point is, whether or not you have to implement these data structures and algorithms, they still exist in the very technology we use every day. So it's helpful to know the basics. The second reason you should learn data structures and algorithms is because of the way many companies conduct interviews. Now, to be fair, many amazing small and mid-sized companies don't necessarily quiz you on number of islands, but the unicorn fintech, big tech, and fan companies certainly do. Whether that's fair or not is a topic we can discuss in the future, but it's definitely needed to get into those companies. Okay, so enough about data structures and algorithms. Next up is system design or architecture. System design is looking at things from a bird's eye view. Sure, we know how to use sliding window or what the four main properties of OOP are, but do we know how these systems work as a whole? Understanding how the client interacts with the server is step number one. After that, learning why we use distributed systems to control the influx of data, decoupling functions by having several APIs, using load balancers to direct traffic to specific servers, horizontally or vertically scaling those servers, setting up authentication, and even knowing when and where to cache frequently queried data. System design principles are your friend. Along with system design, you'll have to understand the basics of Git and database management. These aren't as pressing though, because it's something you can easily pick up on the job. The next thing is testing fundamentals. Testing fundamentals are really important. There's a lot of variability when it comes to the way you test your applications. Unit tests, for example, are exactly as they sound. They test several units, methods or functions within your application. If you write publicly accessible methods, ideally that method should mock function calls or create dummy return values for calls to other methods within your method that you're testing and check that specific return values have been received. 
with integration tests, you're literally testing the integration between services. So if you have a database and you want to test that your application is able to connect to that database in the first place and receive the correct response, this counts as an integration test. Now, you're not sending a request via HTTP protocol to your API. Processing the entire request and propagating it throughout your app and expecting a response back. We're only testing the interaction between two external services and not the end-to-end -end outcome. Functional testing is more like an end-to-end -end test. So this is where we may start at the top and use an embedded client to send a request to our application and ensure that we're able to fully process a request and receive the correct response. Manual testing is equally as important. You'll be deploying in different environments, and it's good to not just test locally, but also with real-life production-like data in a development and production environment. Lastly, learn a language and build something. There's really no point in learning these abstract concepts unless you practice and build something in real life. Choose a backend language, maybe Kotlin or C-sharp, pick a framework. Micronaut or .NET are good options. Choose your front-end languages and frameworks or libraries as well. Maybe you can use React with TypeScript, CSS, and HTML. Also, choose an IDE to develop on. It may help to pair Visual Studio with Visual Studio Code or even IntelliJ IDEA with Visual Studio Code for both back-end and front-end development. And in the spirit of sharing resources with all of you, feel free to check out the description below. I've linked a bunch of resources that I mentioned in today's video. You really don't want to miss out on an opportunity to have a comprehensive list of items to learn in order to fulfill your goal of becoming a software engineer. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot and motivates me to make more videos in the long run. If you like this video, be sure to also check out my video about becoming a software engineer. I talk about the different aspects of software engineering, and I also have some resources on my channel for interview prep. So again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.